Hi, everybody. Thank y'all for coming out today. Uh, my name is Jace. I'm the youth librarian here at Pleasant Hill, and we're really excited to have a special guest. I want to I want to thank Angel from the Central Texas Mycological Society. Uh, she paired us up with Alicia Gabriel, who is, uh, has this lovely new book, Funky Fungi, that we're going to be um, just going to do some reading from today. We're going to do some mushroom dissection and, and do some activities involving mushrooms. Uh, Alicia is a, a music teacher up in Round Rock and has um, published five books. She does have some copies for sale today for $17. If you'd like to get a copy, that's fine, but there's no pressure. We do also, the library has the book as an ebook through Hoopla, so you can always check those out on the Hoopla app from home. Uh, and I think with that, oh, just to mention, we are going to be doing a live stream today for folks that aren't, gonna, um, that aren't making it here. It's not going to be a permanent recording, but just know that if you do, we're going to have some times to come up, but just kind of keep in mind that if you do come up, there, there will be a live stream. So just, but yeah, all right, well, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're able to come out today, and it's nice to be in person with people and sharing books, and I love reading, of course, and writing. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about the journey of how I got here. So when I was your age, I lived up in New York and I have an older brother and my dad was in the military and we moved around a lot. And so some of the very first pieces that I wrote as a child were about my brother, were about moving to new places. And yes, I, I dug these out of an old folder. And I chuckled when I thought this because I really had a hard time like with my margins, I think. But you know, it's a lot of fun. So I loved writing. I practiced some, you know, some drawing. I thought maybe I would be an author illustrator at one point. I, I wrote a little comic about a dog named Sandy because you know I had a dog named Sandy. So um they all say write what you know, but I like to add on to that or what you want to learn about. So if something is really interesting to you, then that might be something to write about. So my story is we're about a nice little girl with a bratty brother. Um, my dog being Sandy, moving to a new place and school. Now, I started out writing something for magazines. So I have an article published in Pocket and I have a little thing that highlights for children. And that was great, it was part of my journey. And in addition, I went up to the Highlights for Children. They have a, a retreat center. And I did a workshop. This was about 10 years ago. And I met these lovely people up there. And they became part of my critique group. And so we send each other work every month. And we're a nonfiction critique group. So like you mostly work nonfiction. And I met this really awesome lady named Sue. Sue is my co-author on this book. Now, 10 years ago, when we first met, we were walking around the trails in upstate New York, which is actually really close to where I grew up. Well, this was Pennsylvania, but um, so anyway, there we were walking around, we're finding fungi everywhere, and we find out that we actually have this topic in common, like that we're so interested in fungi. But I wanted to write an early reader for kids. I got a little short book, you know, like little chapters. She wanted to write more of a scientist in the field, write about a mycologist. So, we had this interest, but we didn't really pursue it because we're interested in other things. In fact, in that, that time period that I've known her, I've published a couple of five books. These three are nonfiction, and these two are fiction. So these are for the younger set, kindergarten to second, and these are third to fifth. So these were for educational publishers, and it was great. They would assign me a topic, and I would go, wow, so cool. I'm going to learn more about this. And I would write it so in the back of my mind. I kept thinking, but fungi. Oh, so like so fascinating. There's so much to learn. And so finally, I couldn't get out of my mind. And so I called Sue. And normally we just emailed each other, but I called her and I said, you know, that topic of fungi, do you remember when you wanted to write this middle grade nonfiction book? And she was like, Yeah. So I said, but let's do one together, right? I teach full time. It's really hard for me to, to write a 126 page book by myself, but I said, if we work together on it, I think we could do this. So we started working on an introduction, like something that would really grab an editor's attention. And I also knew that I wanted to write a book for this series. So if you're not familiar with it, I'll just say that it is Chicago Review Press is the publisher, and this is part of the Young Naturalist series. And all of these books have 30 activities in them, and they're amazing. I love the series of books. 
And some of my friends have written for this very series. And so I knew I wanted to write for them. So we sent it to an editor, just kind of like, hey, would you be interested in reading a proposal about this? The next day, we came back. And we're like, all oh, right. And so then we worked for about a month on writing a proposal. And we sent it to him. About two weeks later, we got a contract off. This is it. He wants this book. And we're so excited to work on it. And then the hard part came. And we had to write the rest of the book, <laughs> which was great, though. And so two years later, here we have Funky Fun Guy. It just came out this summer at the end of June. And so it was, it was a two year journey, but really it was about one year of writing it. And then um, a year of like looking at proofs and looking at how they had it laid out and saying, mm -hmm, that's not correct, you have to fix that, right? Things like that until finally we have this really beautiful book and I'm very proud of it. So that's why I'm so excited I get to share it with you. So I'd like to take just a few minutes to read little parts of the book. And I'm gonna start with the introduction. Now, I imagine that anyone who's here probably knows quite a bit about the mushrooms and fungi, but you know what? I was quite surprised as I was researching for this book, how many different things that I wasn't aware of. So, in the introduction, when you bite into a mushroom top pizza, you're eating a fungus. Sorry, I'm going to keep that. And that fuzzy mold splashed on the cheese at the back of the fridge, that's a fungus too. From thick shelf-like brackets, growing on trees to hard, bumpy lichens that are covering boulders. There are fungi all around us. So many that if you scooped a single teaspoon of soil from your garden, there would be several yards of fungal filament. Like most of the fungi on our planet, they are too small to see without magnification. If you ask a friend what a fungus is, chances are they'll mention mushrooms. Munch, I'm sorry, mushrooms are actually the fruiting bodies of fungi, and they come in a fascinating array of bright corals, darkly covered brains, and spotted umbrellas. Fungi are not only beautiful, they are also important to everything living around them, people, plants, and animals. Fungi are nature's decomposers turning fallen leaves, branches, and trees into nutrients for the next generation of forest seedlings. They also form partnerships with plants, helping move nutrients to leaves. They provide food for deer, squirrels, and rabbits, as well as slugs and insects. And if some fungi cause itchy feet and human diseases, others are used to cure disease. Crime scene investigators use fungi to help determine who done it, and cleanup crews depend on fungi to clear toxic spills. Fungi have inhabited the earth for nearly a billion years and are a diverse group. There are more than 140,000 named species and scientists are discovering new ones every year. By comparison, there are around 6,500 species of mammals. Researchers estimate that most of the world's fungi have yet to be discovered and that the total number of fungi might be close to three and a half million species. In 2017, scientists described an orange salt tolerant mushroom collected in the Andes Mountains, an Andes Mountain range in Chile. A couple of years later, scientists found two new species of fungi in a melting glacier in the Canadian Arctic. Imagine growing in below freezing temperatures. Like animals and plants, Fungi are threatened by habitat loss, climate change, pollution, and overharvesting. But even simple acts, such as clearing dead wood, can affect fungi that play a critical role in the forest habitat. Conservationists and scientists are working together to protect endangered fungi in their landscapes before it is too late. Now, that's just the introduction, or most of the introduction. Here is the very beginning of chapter one, and I'm gonna skip around just a little bit here. No matter where you are at this very minute, there is a good chance that there's a fungus or two nearby. That's because fungi, plural of fungus, live all around us. They live in the air, in our homes, in soil and sand, on rocks, on plants and animals, in the deepest part of the ocean, and even on your body. While some form mushrooms, most fungi are so small, you can't see them without using the microscope.
Yeah, let's skip over a couple of pages. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about fungal anatomy, and then we're going to call a few people up to help me out with the next part. All right, here we go, fungal anatomy. The parts we call mushrooms are the spore producing fruiting bodies of fungi. Some look like umbrellas with stalks and caps. Others might have flat tops or form round puffballs. Types of fungi look like miniature vapor, whereas a lion's mane fungus clumps together with strands that hang down and they thin to a point. Some fungi, like purple coral fungi and stinkhorns, seem like they belong under the sea instead of in the woods. Stinkhorns look egg like until the sides open, then they resemble an octopus tentacles. The fruiting bodies are the part of the fungus that we see. The major part of the fungus is a cobweb of thin threads growing beneath the soil or spreading through leaf litter and under bark. Imagine what you would see if fruit trees grew under grass. You'd never see their trunks, branches, twigs, and leaves. The only time you would notice them would be when they fruited. And then you'd only see the apples, peaches, pears, or plums poking up through the soil. Most fungi don't produce fruiting bodies. Not only that, most are so small, you'd need a mic microscope to see them. So you might not realize they're living all around us. You probably don't notice molds until they've grown a colony on a piece of bread or fruit or in the corner of your shower. And baker's yeast is a single cell fungus so tiny that 3,000 could easily fit on the period at the end of a sentence. I'm pause right here. Let's talk about. Ah, here we go. The parts of a mushroom. Can you name the parts of a mushroom? Who thinks they might know about this part up here? What might we call that part? I see a very bright hand. What would we call that part? Very nice. It is the cap. Nice. What about these little things underneath the cap? The gills. The gills. Very oh, nice. Yes. I love it. Yes. The gills are underneath the cap. Now, some of our mushrooms are not going to have gills, right? Some of them might also um, have the um, pores, right? Okay. Underneath it. But yeah, so we've got our gills. What about down here? Okay. Stem. Yeah. Yes. There are several different names that people can call them, right? So sometimes I hear stem, I might hear stalk, or I might hear stem, right? I'll take any of the above, right? So, so far, it looks like we've done some great things, but I thought it would be fun if we dissected a mushroom together. Yeah. Yes. All right. And I'm going to need a little bit of help today to dissect the mushroom. Now, I'll be honest, I was looking in my refrigerator because, you know, I buy mushrooms every week. I love cooking with mushrooms, but it was it was really small. So instead, today, I, I brought a bigger one. All right. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So we are going to dissect this mushroom here. Yeah. And I am going to need some helpers. In fact, maybe, um, Angel, do you think you can help me get four? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You've done such a good job answering the question. Do you want to come let's go? Yeah. Next, you're even running. We're just going to chop it up, right? <laughs> I like it. I do. I like this. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bring that up here. Yeah, yeah. Because when we do this, it's the middle part. Right there. You ready? Okay. Would you take off that top part for me and hold that for me? Awesome. Would you take off this little skirt like thing right there for me? Nice. And would you chop that in half for me? <laughs> Nicely done. Okay. Would you hold that for me? Awesome. Okay. Well, I wonder. Could you see right here so everybody can see your parts? Okay, cool. So this part that we just cut in half, you did that really well, okay, I love that. So what part was this that we cut in half? Stem. Yeah, stem. Yeah, you forgot this site too, that's fine. So what I think is so fascinating
find is if you were actually out in the woods or something and you, you got a mushroom and you opened it up, you might see these little mycelial threads. Like it's not just going to be the solid piece of felt, right? You would see this little stringy part, which is so cool. Now you've got this other important part. This kind of um, mushroom that I kind of made mine to look like, it's an Armonina muscaria, and it has this veil. That's okay, you can't hurt it, yeah. So it has this universal veil. When it first is growing and coming up out of the ground, it actually looks like an egg. It's kind of like white, it's tiny, but then as it starts to grow, it breaks out of it. And this little veil part, it kind of looks like a skirt at first, right? Yeah, it hangs down. But did you know that these warts on top of the mushroom are actually remnants of that veil. This sort of thing is really important when you're out looking at mushrooms and you're trying to identify something that you have found is to know about the veil. Now there's lots of different kinds of veils, right? It doesn't always look exactly the same, but for this one, we try to move it. So we can see the bottom part. Ah, and what do we call these little things again? The gills, very nice. So when you're looking at a mushroom out in the woods or something, sometimes the gills, they kind of end right there, right? They're separate. They, they don't run into the, the site, but sometimes they do. And so knowing what kind of mushroom you're looking at and using a field guide can be really helpful when you're looking at those gills. Thank you so much for your help today in dissecting our mushroom. Would you please give them a round of applause? Good job, everybody. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you so much. And we'll just pop that back on. Thank you. Can I stop sharing screen so I can focus on that? Okay, good. Thanks. Uh -huh. So you can just reshare your screen. Okay. So I need to reshare my screen. I think I can do that. This one right here. All right. Now let's see where I left off here. Okay. So to recap, most of the time when you're looking at your mushrooms, you're either going to have the gills underneath or you're going to have the pores. And that's where the spores are hiding up there. And it's not until they're mature that they'll drop down and spread. And that's how you know, we get more mushrooms. So the next part of my presentation is sometimes people will ask me, what's your favorite part of the book? And then I'm like, oh no, <laughs> how can I choose a part? The, the thing that was so amazing is when I wrote this with my friend Sue Heavenrich, is we did kind of divvy it up a little bit. Right? I was mostly in charge of certain chapters and she was most, mostly in charge of other chapters, but then we would send it to each other and we would look over it, we would check sources, read through it, give each other suggestions, and then we talk on the phone. I was in town, and we would read the whole, the whole chapter aloud to each other, and we would revise it and change it together because we didn't want it to sound like, oh, Sue obviously wrote that chapter or Alicia obviously wrote that one. It really was a joint effort, but to kind of divide and conquer and make sure that we met all the deadlines, we did kind of spearhead one part and then another person would be working on another chapter at the same time, and then we would divide it up in that way. So we both actually worked on this chapter that I'm going to read to you, just parts of the chapter, and it's chapter number seven. This one is called putting fungi to work. Fungi generally mind their own business. Digesting dead leaves, dissolving histones, but people have discovered that fungi can be useful partners. Investigators use fungi to help solve crimes. Shippers use fungi as packing material, and farmers use fungi to help control pests. Fungi even play a role in household cleaning. Believe it or not, a lot of enzymes that are in your cleaning products are from fungal enzymes. I'm skipping over to the part about packing materials. The fruits, vegetables, and grains that you find in the grocery store are only the edible parts of the plants. What happens to the leftover stalks, 
than the other parts of the plant. Some innovative people are using fungi to transform the inedible stems, leaves, and vines into environmentally friendly products, such as textiles, construction materials, furniture, and packaging materials. If a manufacturer needs a protective package to ship their product, they might turn to a company such as e Ecovative Design to create one for mycelium. The company designs a reusable plastic form to fit the product. Then they fill it with mycelium and hemp herbs, the chopped up stalks of fiber hemp plants. Then they allow the mycelium to grow for a few days. Once the mycelium has covered the form, they dehydrate the packaging to be sure the mycelium stops growing. They pop the mycelium package out of the form and begin the whole process again. It only takes a while. Products can then be packed in their custom mycelium packages and shipped to stores. When a customer gets the product home, they can compost the packaging, which breaks it down in about a month. Not only is this better for the environment than styrofoam or plastic packaging that would end up in landfills, but by composting the mushroom packaging, nutrients are returned to the soil. More and more mushroom packaging is being made for all kinds of products, but it has also inspired other mycelium-based projects. So I think IKEA was one of the first companies to start using this kind of packaging. So you might notice the next time you're there and you get something, it is actually this product. So using fungi in art and architecture. Once a decomposing fungus has attacked a piece of wood, it breaks down the lignin, making the wood softer and less dense. Sorry, I had a picture to go along with that. I totally forgot. There it is. Okay. So, <laughs> Let's see. Sometimes it even makes the wood beautiful. Woodworkers often search for fungi infected logs called spalted wood to make decorative items such as bowls, boxes, and musical instruments. Depending on the fungi, woodworkers can end up with interesting colors and designs in their wood. I'm pointing out this one here because this spalted wood I found on a trail in June up in Sitka, Alaska. I was just walking along and there it was. And so that's pretty amazing. It's the first time I've seen spalted wood just kind of out in the open. And so I wanted y'all to get to see it was amazing. One fungus creates black zigzagging lines in the wood. White rot fungi lightens or bleaches the color of the wood as it breaks down the lignin. And other fungi produce pigments that stain the wood blue, pink, green, or other colors. Sometimes a lucky carver finds all three types of spalting in the same piece of wood. Spalted wood is so cool that scientists and woodworkers have found ways to inoculate wood with fungi on purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only way people are using fungi in art and architecture. Architects at The Living Company in New York were inspired by the mycelium packaging being made by Ecovative Design. What else could be made with mycelium, they wondered. Could we make bricks? Yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, they needed to submit plans for an innovative structure to win the Young Architects Program competition. So they designed a three-legged tower that fed into three chimney-like openings made of mycelium bricks. It would require 10,000 bricks and rise about 40 feet into the sky. They even built a model in a small wall made of mycelium bricks for this competition. They won, <laughs> and that meant that their project called the Haifi Tower would be built and exhibited for three months at the MoMA PS1, the Museum of Modern Art in Queens, New York. The architects enlisted Ecovative Design to make the bricks for the tower. Ecovative's engineers started with corn stalks from local farmers. They broke the corn stalks up into smaller pieces, inoculated them with mycelium, and poured the mixture into plastic forms. After about five days, the mycelium had woven around the corn stalks and filled the brick forms. Still, it took 10 weeks to grow 10,000 bricks. Once the bricks were ready, the architects hired masons to construct the tower. The lightweight bricks and unique shape of the structure complicated the assembly, so several architects and college students stepped in to help. The lead architect, David Benjamin, said they laid out templates and bricks and prepared string guidelines to help position everything correctly. It took about four weeks to build the tower. 
When the exhibit ended, the hyphae tower was disassembled and composted, allowing nutrients to return to the soil. Benjamin said that in the near future, mycelium material could be further engineered to create structural blocks, columns, and panels for larger and more complex buildings. We are only just getting started. That's not all of chapter seven, but those were some of my favorite sections of chapter seven. So we're not done, but a few housekeeping things. So if you did bring one of my books with you today, I'd be happy to autograph it. Three of my books are available for purchase today, so you can swing by there. But the, the library does have a digital copy of the book, so I highly recommend that you check it out and do some of the activities that are in the book because it's everything from some hands-on experiments having to do with fungi to some craft things. I'm even encouraging students to either make their own notebook or, you know, get a ready-made notebook and decorate it in order to keep track of some of the activities that they're doing and what they discover. And one of the activities, for example, is to follow a, a, a mushroom or another type of fungus that you might find in your yard or park. And I did that. I think I can back up and find a picture. Uh-oh. There it is. Okay. This is all from my yard, by the way. So I followed this bracket fungus the whole time I was writing this book and even after it. And it was decomposing this little stump here that was underneath another tree. Now it's gone. It, like the stump is gone, right? Okay? And at first I was kind of sad. I was like, oh no, they put it the fungus though. Well then like I was out in my yard and, and there's like some roses over there and there was this little piece. And I'm guessing like a small animal just like took the little leftover dried piece. And it was there, but then not far away, there was this other old stump underneath and there's a little tiny fungus starting to grow on that stump now and I was like oh I think this forest traveled over there to that stump and so it's really exciting to discover things in your yard and you might not even know about all the different kinds of fungi that are in your yard and to actually take a really close look. Okay so one thing is sometimes people say well how can I help an author because if you're like me I check out so many books from the library, I could not possibly buy all the books that I'm interested in. And that's why I love the library, right? That, that's why I'm here doing a visit here. So if you're able, the biggest way that you can help an author is to post a review online after you've looked at their book and you've read through it and stuff. Amazon reviews are especially helpful. They say that you need 50 reviews on Amazon before their analytics will actually start to promote your book. I know it's crazy and Goodreads is also another great place and but if you post a review on Amazon it'll show up on Goodreads but if you do it on Goodreads it won't show up on Amazon mm -hmm. weird stuff right okay recommend the book to teachers and librarians ask your library to order a copy talk to librarians and PTA members about setting up school visits and of course I also love to go to science nights and other special events and so you know they can reach out to me through my website or whatever, and I have bookmarks with all that information on it. But now, now it's time for that craft activity that I promised. So this craft time today is going to be a bit of a contest. We are going to be using some homemade Play-Doh that I brought along, and you are going to get to form a mushroom or any other kind of fungus that you want. So for this one, it could be one that you make up. You're going to then want to make sure you write your name on the paper so we know who's this who's. Place your entry on the paper, and when the time is up, the judges are going to award some prizes. So I do have some really beautiful bookmark prizes. You can color the fungi on one side of it and the book is on the other side. And two lucky winners will go home with the mushroom necklace today. But I want you to have fun with this activity. So I made five different colors of Play-Doh because well, you, know, you might need more than one color to make the mushroom that you're envisioning in your mind. So I did kind of roll them into some small balls 
what you might do if you, know, if you have a sibling with you or someone near you and maybe they don't need that full one, maybe they just need half of that color and you want a, a part of their color, you can like share with them. But I think there's probably nothing here for everybody to have at least two colors. Okay, at least two colors. So start with two colors and let's make sure everybody gets at least two colors before we try to get more colors out of it. I'm gonna kind of separate them so that everybody can find them easily because I kind of had to layer them in here due to space. Okay. So let's get, everybody's gonna need a piece of paper. Those tables back there are for you to, you know, stand at the table, have a little bit of workspace, right? And then of course, again, you're gonna grab maybe two, two different colors to begin with. So, any kiddos that want to start, come on up, grab your paper. Yeah, you ready? You ready? Okay. Let's start with two pieces of play-doh. Remember, you can share with somebody too. Okay, okay, you got one? Did you get paper? Okay, there you go. Maybe take your stuff to those tables over there so that you have a nice workspace. You got paper? You there? I love that hat. That is awesome. You're just going to put your name on it and then use it as your room. So we don't get the table. So we're going to walk around the ground and talk about trees. So next Saturday next month, we're having a diversity festival with the ranger out here. Okay, so we're going to put your name on it and then use it as your room. 